if you want to uh, ask questions to the speaker. Unfortunately, right now I cannot hear you if you I cannot see you if you stand in front of your microphone. Thus, I would kindly ask you to go to um, either on Twitter or Mastodon and use the hashtag RC3R3S or go to Hackint um, on in, in the IRC on the channel RC3-R3S. All are numbers and letters. Also, we are streaming on Twitch and YouTube. Um, you can search for our streams by using the remote the remote Rheinruhr stage. Um, use it one word or three words, whatever you like. You will probably find it. So to go on from here um, about our speaker, he is a he is studying industrial design in Eindhoven, and part of his uh, thesis is uh, is this talk. And uh, he wants to illuminate uh, privacy from the aspects both of design and development, as he is both a designer and a developer. And this talk was presented also at the uh, Dutch Design Week. So give it up for Lai. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, let me get right to it. Uh, so hi there. As I'm said, I'm Lai. Uh, currently presenting from uh, this man cave in Eindhoven, the Netherlands. Uh, software engineer by trades, designer by education, and uh, some of you might wonder, what does that mean? Uh, well, it means that I have an interest in a couple of things, in the overlap between both of those fields. So there's privacy, there's personal information, and there's also user experiences. And uh, simultaneously, it means I can cherry pick the aspects I like from both fields, while also blatantly ignoring all the same practices that have been set in both fields. Um, that will be a recurring theme in this talk. Uh, so let's talk about this uh, personal information. Um, I want to share a story uh, of my personal in uh, information as well and uh, taking control of it specifically. Uh, we'll be talking about personal information a lot. So let's consider what personal information is for a brief minute. Uh, by law, personal information is any information that is related to you as an individual. It's sort of infectious. See as if uh, your hand that just touched the elevator button is information. And as soon as you touch your face, it's infected. Link to your name, it's personal information. Data point link to your IP, it's personal information. Link to a hashed bank account number, it's personal information. If it can be connected to you in any way, it's considered personal information by law. And uh, what's more to know about personal information on 2020? So we know that uh, governments care little for our personal information at this point. Uh, we know private corporations uh, care little for our personal information, unless we pay for it, that is. Um, in fact, we know our personal information is actively being used to manipulate us. And consequently, we know that about six out of 10 Europeans worry about a lack of control over their personal information. And here, I'll just assume that the remaining four out of 10 haven't been paying attention. So. Where do you even start? It's very easy to feel sort of overwhelmed by this knowledge uh, that we just ignore it. We get into this sort of uh, Stockholm syndrome where we still dive into the YouTube hole or the infinite Facebook scroll with a this is my life now attitude. What did you do last night? Well, I went in the six hour bender last night uh, watching Kim Kardashian's wedding, how the earth is flat and the leads drink baby blood in satanic rituals. It was really inspiring. Well. That's a joke, of course, but it says enough about 2020 that this is apparently closer to reality than the self-lacing shoes and flying cars we were promised. So what can I do? We've got all these issues. How can I make a difference? Uh, and that is, how can we actually do, uh, what can we actually do besides becoming digital hermits and casting our devices into the fire? And we as hackers, engineers, and privacy junkies answer this question often somewhat condescendingly. Like, Oh, sure, it's easy. Just delete your social media accounts, block some ads and trackers, uh, join the Fediverse, petition your members of parliament, maybe write some new antitrust legislation yourself, prosecute the rich elites profiting of our data, drive a fan filled with magnets to the Facebook data center, and walk barefoot across a sea of lava to cleanse your iPhone in Mount Doom. I think a better question here is, what can we feasibly do as individual citizens? What can we do to sort of skirt the life abandoning decisions um, while still making a tangible impact when it comes to 
the average citizen's privacy. And let me do some cheerleading here for specifically the GDPR. Uh, I personally think it's a fantastic set of laws that solve some of these problems. Um, and some people might, might disagree with me here. Like, is it a perfect law? No, sure. Were some of the concepts prior law as well? Yes, of course they were. Um, has it er eradicated big tech power, fears, failures of the human condition, and brought world peace? Not really. But remember that individual aspect of doing something, anything. This is where the GDPR does make a difference. Uh, so let's unpack this whole thing that we call the GDPR. Uh, not the entire thing, of course, but let's cherry pick precisely the aspects that help me play to its savior complex strengths. Fundamentally, the GDPR is about consent and transparency. So first, there's consent. The idea that you get a say about what happens with your data. And I'm going to sk skip any further discussion here, as the state of it is depressing enough as is, so anyone else can go and clean up that mess. Uh, rather, we'll talk about transparency. Transparency is the notion that organizations that process your personal information provide truthful information of what they collect and how they process it. Just like, just like in Christopher Nolan's latest movie, transparency can move forwards and backwards. Forwards transparency uh, are the data processing registers and the consent notices. This is what we're going to do to your precious data. Backwards transparency is the look at what you've made me do of personal information. Fortunately, we have a more sexy sounding name for what we can do here. And it's called data rights. So uh, during the GDPR law making process, the lawmakers had some fun, they felt generous like Oprah. And as a result, we ended up uh, kind of coincidentally with a set of rights related to our data. Uh, there's the right to access your data. There's the right to rectify data that's incorrect. There's the right to erase data if you don't want to have it there. There's the right to restrict uh, certain data if you want to, certain data processing. There's the right to notification of what it is processed. You have the right to take the data along with you. And you also have the right to object to data processing practices uh, of your personal information. Um, and these things are pretty powerful. All EU citizens get to enjoy them and they get to exercise them with whomever is processing their personal information. You can basically go up to any organization and say, this is a robbery. I want my data. And they have to comply. Not complying is expensive. Fines are uh, up to either 10 million euros or 2% of global turnover, whichever is more. So not less. That's ridiculous. Um, so when I found this out, I felt like quite the hacker that I was going to be. Uh, I'm going to go out, I'm going to retrieve all my data, and there's no one to stop me. Uh, so I did. I actually went out uh, to about 59 uh, organizations to which I sent um, uh, data requests. And uh, this was all kinds of companies. It's, uh, we, I sent them to big tech, I sent them to insurers, banks, dentists, doctors, bakers, hairdressers public transport companies, basically any company that is in on this whole digital transformation narrative that seems popular today. And this is what that looked like. Um, so this is an actual request uh, uh, in, in legal mumbo jumbo uh, that allows you to gather your data. And I want to shout out, shout out to uh, My Data Don't Write. Uh, that's a Bits of Freedom uh, initiative, initiative uh, among others. Uh, that helped me generate this mumbo jumbo quite easily uh, and send it out myself. Uh, and I sent most of those uh, by email, uh, as that was the sort of standard uh, for these kind of things. Uh, but for some of them, that didn't uh, pan out as smoothly as I wanted it to. Uh, so for some, I actually had to go and print them out, leave my house, and put them in a physical mailbox in 2020. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> In one case, I had to actually physically come over to one organization's headquarters to sign a form and elaborate in person what I was actually doing and why I wanted to do it. And breaking some character here, I actually have to hand it to Big, Big Tech regarding the amount of engineering hours they've in invested into making requesting data a half-decent experience. They've got this particular thing figured out 
So uh, when we're talking about the Apple, uh, Facebook, uh, Spotify, Instagram, LinkedIn, data request platforms, they're actually not that bad. They're the best out of the bunch. But it's the only compliment that I will be giving those kinds of companies during this talk. Um, because fortunately, <laughs> those practices were contrasted by almost everyone else doing the worst possible job. Um, at the 30-day mark, which is the legal limit for responding to data requests, um, about 40% 40, 40 of requests was still unanswered. And still, about right now, uh, so I did those in uh, March probably, nine months later, 20% of those requests still remain unanswered. Uh, and that's, that's just painful to me. And it doesn't even include like all the back and forth emailing I had to do, uh, the reminders uh, uh, that I actually had requested data, uh, that it's been 30 days and how almost everyone asked me to send a copy of my passport in a plain text email. It was just not great. The experience wasn't great. Um, but then we get to go over the actual responses and like, I want to go to my favorite one first. And this is where a bank, uh, sent over a mail career to my house, uh, uh, which they announced about a week in advance, uh, who asked for my passport, then checked it, made a copy of it, took that along with him and then handed me this USB stick. And if it's uh, laying around uh, right here, it's, it's a fun piece of memorabilia. Um, this USB stick contained the data that they sent back to me. And uh, even though I like uh, data being physical a lot as a designer, uh, that must have been a ridiculously expensive operation for them to do, especially as more people start asking for their data. Um, and then on the complete other end of the spectrum, um, I sent out a request to the Dutch Tax and Revenue Service. Uh, which returned to me this uh, six-page middle finger, uh, basically flat out rejected my request uh, unless I uh, made the request very detailed and very specific. And while I expected some corporate backlash, I must admit that I was kind of caught off guard by the whole uh, European government agency being completely hostile to any notion of user data rights. It was kind of off-putting. Um, but then we get to the actual data that I uh, got back. So uh, this is a tiny piece of what I received. I received over 2,200 files covering all parts of the data spectrum. So of course there's CSV files, there's JSON files there, there's XML files. Uh, but more often than not, uh, I encountered Excel files, HTML files, JPEG files, screenshots, PDFs, text files, um, in some cases, I received uh, data via the mail, so I had to either scan it in myself and then get all the data in. And you can go on and on and on. Like there's there's a ridiculous amount of uh, of returned uh, types of data in here. And while I read JSON fluently, there's also the point of the massive influx of data that made it very hard to grasp what it actually meant to me. All the data that I retrieved. And I'm not alone here. Uh, a couple of scholars went out and uh, requested all of their data in a similar way. Uh, one, research, one research actually ended up getting access to uh, his colleagues data uh, by just spoofing their email address. There was no authentication or check whatsoever. The secretary basically just assumed that the email was valid and sent the whole dump of someone's personal info over to a complete stranger. And uh, they also found that passports are regularly sent back and forth using just plain text email. Uh, particularly Wong and Henderson found that over half of the responses they got to their data requests did not comply with the machine readability standards that are set forth by the GDPR. But if there's any common ground between uh, all of them and myself uh, is that the process was exhausting, frustrating, and ridiculously slow. In fact, it was so poor that I haven't considered using any of my data rights ever since those experiences. It was, it was horrible. Um, so that's why I wondered to myself, can't we do better? And I mean this in an end-to-end -end sense. So can we do the whole process from uh, regressing your data to getting it, to viewing it, to storing it, to actually doing something with it, getting insights? Uh, all of those uh, things. So that's why I built Eon. 
And Eon is pretty simple. It's a desktop application that does exactly this end of end, uh, end to end stuff of personal information. So there's the request, there's the archiving, there's the getting insights. And uh, I'll briefly walk you through how that works for a regular user. So first of all, there's this account overview where you add all of your online accounts. So right now you can uh, add your Spotify accounts, your Facebook accounts, your Instagram accounts, your LinkedIn accounts. Uh, there are ways of adding other accounts, but I'll get into them later. And as soon as you've added an account, you can start a data request for it. Um, and that basically means that you get a window where you enter your credentials, and then Eon will do all the clicks that are necessary for you. And that's it. Your data has been requested. Uh, the only thing you have to do is wait uh, for it to complete. And then Eon will let you know, like, hey, uh, it's been a couple of days. Your data request is complete. Uh, it's in now. Let's have a look. And when the data request does complete, it just pulls in that data automatically, and it stores it safely on your local disk. And this is where you have the opportunity of actually inspecting it. So you can see a small hint of that in the right bottom corner, where there's an overview of all the data points that came in from a particular data request. Um, but there's better ways of looking at it. So uh, seeing your data chronologi chronolog chronologically is one option. Um, there's also a categorical overview where you can just see the different categories of data. Uh, but you can also uh, view your, uh, all your data as a graph. And here's where you can more easily inspect what's happening. So you can see the data types, uh, where the data came from, which account, which platform, and the individual data points as well. And I'll give you a demo, a demo of that uh, shortly. Um, and then uh, you can actually inspect single data points, individual data points. This is specifically a, a ad interest data point that was in the LinkedIn dump. And um, once you have that concept, concept of a, a single data point going, uh, you can actually bring in that right to rectify uh, that we talked about in the beginning. So if you have the data, you can actually say that this is, this is not a data point that I want you to have and um, uh, object to it, basically. And in Eon, you can uh, select a bunch of those data points that you would like to see deleted. And then Eon will help you generate an email that will uh, ask the, the uh, provider in the, again, legal mumbo jumbo, that's uh, right for uh, these kinds of requests, uh, to delete those specific data points. Um, you just uh, open, up, open it up in your email client and send it off. That's basically it. <laughs> so before I send, uh, show you that quick demo, uh, I want to introduce you to uh, Olaf. Uh, and Olaf has grown quite close to me over the past half year. Um, I've learned that uh, Olaf likes Formula One, he likes football. He's actually a junior football coach over in his birthplace of uh, Veldhoven. And we've grown so close, in fact, that he felt comfortable that I gather his data and display it publicly for all of you to see. Uh, I must admit, though, that Olaf had little choice in the matter because just like trickle-down economics, Olaf isn't real. I fabricated him as an alter ego for me and a set of study participants to work with during the Eon development. Uh, but you'll get to learn everything about him in this short demo. So let me move quickly out of this presentation and go over to the next screen where you'll see the actual Eon application uh, going. So here's this timeline overview where you get to view all of the recent data requests that came in. So specifically, there's tiny ones for uh, Instagram where apparently a couple of ad interests got deleted. Uh, you can see, uh, for instance, if you uh, think those ad interests are very interesting, you can browse, browse by them one by one and see where they're coming from. By and large, they're coming from LinkedIn in this case. And this is a did that graph overview for Olaf specifically. So here you can see um, the Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Sp uh, Spotify, and Instagram platforms and how those data types uh, relate to them. So for instance, uh, LinkedIn and Facebook both have extensive place of ref residence type data points um, for uh, Olaf. So uh, the, the Olaf I came up with basically. Um, and when you go out and click a specific data point, you can just delete it and then find uh, the generated email quite easily over here. So that's it for the short demo. Let me come back to here. 
and then uh, start answering the hard questions. So now that you've seen everything, your original question should be, how uh, does this all work? Um, and remember the thing I said about disregarding sane engineering practices? Uh, well, if you are an engineer that really cares, cares about native software practices, this is probably the moment where you want to step out and mute the stream for a couple of minutes, because I will not only promote, but defend and actively encourage practices that will, by those people, will probably be uh, decried as heretical. <laughs> uh, so while we wait for them to leave, <laughs> I'll reveal that uh, basically for Eon, everything is Electron. It's TypeScript, so that's JavaScript, almost all the way down. And for those not in the know, Electron basically packages the web browser Chrome into a desktop application. While that's not a new idea, Electron, in my opinion, is the first mature attempt at doing so. And it's consequently used by a lot of applications that you use on a daily basis. So uh, think Microsoft Teams, for instance, which if you have have been uh, locked uh, into for the last couple for this uh, year this last year and there are a couple of re reasons for using electron in this project specifically and i'll tell you about them so first of all there's the electron browser apis so we do a lot in the background to make sure that the user doesn't have to do anything and as uh, all the platforms are basically front ends only so they don't expose any apis um, we just default to making clicks on behalf of the user. So we open up this window, the user enters their credentials, and then basically we just use this browser window to make clicks for them. So we click the specific button sequences and pages uh, to get that uh, data request going and actually download it in the end. And this means we don't have to do any password storage magic whatsoever. We can just rely on native browsers. And that means we uh, use existing flows without complicating stuff for ourselves. Um, and then there's the developer experience and the prototype ability of an Electron application. So on the right here, you see a base um, uh, implementation of uh, uh, Instagram um, uh, provider. So this is basically the code that does all the clicks and pulls in the data. And the whole thing that does all of it is about 200 lines, most of which is boilerplate. And since, all, uh, since it's plain old TypeScript, um, a lot of people can get involved uh, quite easily. The bar threshold is very, very low. Um, and then again, the application runs at whatever platform you can throw at it. So it goes for Windows, Mac OS, whether it's Intel, Apple Silicon, it can do Raspberry Pis, it can probably even do your home-cooked BSD distro uh, if you wanted to. Uh, there's no platform-specific code in Eon yet, so all the platforms benefit from the same changes uh, immediately. And then the last one, which is probably the one I will be crucified for, but I'm sticking up for it. Uh, the web has superior cross-platform user experience. There's the rich uh, DOM, there's React patterns that make creating a recognizable, accessible UI from scratch exceedingly easy. Uh, for the rough base view, I just used Cytoscape.js to prototype it in literally, literally a couple hours. You can't beat it with native stuff. Um, Everything's modular. You uh, build a data retriever on the left side, about 200 lines, and then you can just use a JSON defined schema to pick out the data points from all the returned files uh, and the data types that are uh, associated with them. Uh, and uh, because all the data is local, uh, as uh, time moves on, the uh, schema schemas get better, and uh, Eon is able to show you more of the data that you already have. Uh, lastly, emails modular too. So um, uh, we've currently got a Gmail integration that uh, actually uh, reads out some email for you, but we can use this to send out email as well. So if an organization isn't already covered by Eon, we can basically just send out an automated email to them. And when they don't reply, start spamming them with reminders. Um, this works for data request removal of data removal requests as well. So if you want to delete data, we can just automate the process as well. And we can make all of that a lot more inclusive. Uh, last but not least, where does all the data go? It's basically a local Git repository. So we use uh, native uh, libgit too. Uh, not only does it make storing uh, subsequent data requests super efficient in terms of uh, uh, storage capacity, uh, it also makes it really easy to diff the changes between various states of what is essentially your identity. Everything is open source. So uh, you can go over to eon.technology to get started with it. There's some docs there, and we're also on GitHub. 
contributions are warmly welcomed. Uh, if you want to uh, take uh, in for a spin, just let us know uh, your feedback as well. So GitHub issues is definitely open for that. Or, or if you want to help out, then uh, come into GitHub, uh, in GitHub and um, we'll, we'll figure something out. And uh, one thing I wanted to highlight as well, while Eon has the potential of greatly increasing, increasing what little user experience there is currently in data rights, uh, when it comes to data rights, it takes two to tango. So there's you and there's the organization that you're, uh, you're whipping into actually retrieving your data for you. Um, and given that, I wonder whether we can make a similar leap forward for organizations as well, as this will massively increase the user experience for a regular user. So this is where the Open Data Rights API comes in. Um, the premise is very simple. Every organization exposes a single endpoint for user exercisable data rights. Third-party applications can then implement that endpoint and do data rights work on behalf of their users. This could be Eon, but it could just as well be any other from them. It doesn't really matter as long as there is the single point of entry. Uh, and this makes all the front ends for exercising data rights modular in the end. This is sort of double whammy. Eon makes it easier to get a complete picture of your data, while organizations can rely on the already existing front end for all their data rights stuff. There's no need to homebrew it as an organization. So the first proposal for that is already available. So it's in uh, api.opendatarights.org. Uh, and I encourage you to go have a look and comment, it, comment on it. Um, all of that stuff is based on open source and well-known and implemented standards as well. So there's OAuth for authentication and there's schema.org for uh, data typing stuff. Uh, a demo implementation of the Open right Data Rights API is available on demo.opendatarights.org. Uh, um, just as well as the Eon implementation of it. So if you want to take it for a spin, you can just plop that uh, URL into uh, Eon and it will actually uh, let you pull in some fake data. Uh, I was supposed to show you a demo, but in view of time, I will shortly skip it. Um, all that stuff is open source and available as well. Uh, so either on whitepaper.opendatarights.org or on GitHub specifically. Um, contributions are again welcomed. So come and have a look if you're interested in that sort of stuff. So with all of this work having been presented, it's probably time to come to a final conclusion. And I would like to propose the following. Like, I want to start out with the definition that Matthias Funk and I wrote about a year ago, ago about uh, how the concept of privacy and user experience are intertwined. Making privacy work means getting the details right for a wide range of users. I believe getting it right makes a difference between control over your data being technically in place versus actual meaningful control. So when it comes to making privacy work, we need to negotiate design, technology, and legislation very well. Let's bring those forces closer together in the future. Um, and in that vein, also let's consider Eon as basically an SDK for data rights, but now incorporating user experiences and a basis for compliance. If we get that balance right, organizations and citizens uh, stand the game. So in that privacy UX vein, we could apply this pattern even more broadly. Reusable modules that get the technology, legislation, and user experience just right when it needs to be. If you can't think of a place where this kind of standardization is more needed, it's probably time to think again. <laughs> and I won't de delve any deeper into that. Um, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thanks to all the people that have made this journey possible. Uh, those at the Eindhoven University of Technology, uh, at SURF, at Budo uh, and also a shout out to all the RC3 volunteers making all of this stuff work during their Christmas holidays, especially this, uh, this horrible uh, times. Uh, particularly the folks over at uh, the remote Rangu stage in Monheim for providing me uh, with this stage. Cheers and thank you. Thank you very much for this excellent talk. I was muted apparently. Yeah, no worries. Um, so, um, yeah, there are. Uh, let's go straight to the questions. Uh, I really like the talk, by the way, um, and the really awesome project. I quite, I, I would probably personally look at it. So the first question uh, is in terms of the GDPR um, asked from um, FF. What exactly is machine readability? Is it digital, a OCR compatible font or something else? Yeah, and that's that's uh, quite a difficult thing. So the GDPR does have some, some guidelines for it, uh, but I don't think it goes a lot further than machine readability. 
uh, and this is where like the, the the law and technology are kind of off from each other. So uh, in particular, that uh, paper, so that's uh, Wong and Henderson, if I'm right, um, they define machine readable as actually uh, being able to get um, uh, data points uh, in uh, a JSON CSV like format. Uh, and yeah, that didn't pan out greatly for them. So at least what I expect is if there's uh, data in sort of structured format um, that I receive in a structured format rather than printed out on a piece of paper. Uh, and that I have to enter it into Excel or whatever database myself. I would say that that's the low bar. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that. Um, in the uh, over in the RC, Irgendwer uh, sixty one asks uh, um, if your project, if Eon is open for contribution, uh, is there already a standardized guide for implementing a new online services, uh, implementing new online services for data requests? Yes, uh, so there's docs available. So if you go over to docs.eon.technology, I've made a, a short guide into like how this process sort of works. So basically, uh, I call it a provider. So that's uh, a, a, um, the piece of code that gets the data actually is a standardized, standardized clause with a, a couple of methods that uh, do that kind of work. And the fortunate thing is, like the available, the uh, examples from Facebook, Spotify, Instagram, and all that sort of stuff uh, are available. So you can basically just model it on that, uh, try it out locally, and then if it works for you, uh, contribute it in a pull request. I, I will be very happy to take uh, any of those. Okay, uh, let's hope that uh, let's hope that they contribute uh, to your project and add more more possibilities to uh to stick it to the uh to the big tech as yes, you exactly. as you did put it uh so there is a new question from the irc um what is in the uh, what is in development for the future of eon so what are the prospects what are you looking forward to yeah so like i can look at it very bluntly in in terms of features so i think for eon there's still of course lots to do so better automation uh, making it easier to get to these organizations that haven't yet uh, uh um, automated some aspects of doing data requests so that's where the, that email stuff comes in getting some extra services in uh, getting it a bit more user friendly. I've spoken to a lot of people who've used it who, for instance, like some more context. Like I have this huge amount of data. Like, will you tell me what I should uh, particularly be looking at? That's uh, probably an interesting one. Uh, but more broadly speaking, um, I think uh, specifically, specifically the Open Data Rights API uh, has some promise at looking at the industry from a bit of a larger perspective. So uh, I would love to uh, see if we can implement that somewhere, basically anywhere, and uh, take it further from that. I think the open source community can be very helpful in that regard. I would love to see some standard established, um, such as the Open Data Rights API, to make all of that stuff just a little bit easier. So that's that's what I want to be working towards. Sure. So, sounds, sounds like a, a good way to go. And... Um... The, the, since we don't have any more questions, so a reminder, if you want to ask your questions, you can either tweet them or uh, toot them at hashtag RC3R3S or go to uh, over to our, uh, our RC on Hackland RC3-R3S. Um, so one question I have, you you seem to have uh, gone through quite the, the adventure by requesting your own data. <laughs> quite. Um, wh what kind of data do you request from a bakery? Um... <laughs> yeah, because that, that's the funny thing, right? Um, so, of course, um, the, the doctor and the dentist sort of make sense. Uh, I think for me, a specific one was um, my um, uh, hairdressers, actually. Ah, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, like you wouldn't expect them to have any data, but now uh, nowadays, like all of those small little retail shops have CRM systems. So uh, if you do some business with them on the regular, you're probably in one of those systems and there's probably data collected about when your appointments are or your email address or um, they, which is very helpful, by the way, they sent me actual meeting requests via email. I love that feature, but it requires them to store some data as well. So I was just curious uh, what I would get back, but I didn't manage to get through them. So 
I never got to find out. That's the pity. But like there, in, in this day and age, I, I don't think there are lots of companies left that don't store any personal information. Yeah, sure. I mean, even if it's the hairdresser that notes your number down when you make the appointment, right? Yeah, um, exactly. Even that's personal data. So uh, there's also another question again from irgendwer61. Uh, will there be a, a one button to send every company a please delete all my data requests? Ooh, that could be. Like, do you want it? That's the that's the question. <laughs> I mean, since they're asking so so um, so uh, so many questions, I think that they might contribute it. Contribute it. It would be <laughs> it would be really interesting. Also, yeah. to to, to classify the data, maybe to to say uh, I want every tracking data deleted, but like my personal data, like my name and so on, you can keep that. Um, yeah, that would be also interesting. Also, there is a question from our moderator um, or from IRC, I don't know, uh, somebody called Mod, anyway. Uh, what kind of data do you request from a bank? Oh, from a bank? Uh, oh, I need to dig deep to uh, get into actually. So it's this USB stick, which I used for Tiki, which is a Dutch service for doing uh, basically peer-to-peer, small-scale uh, uh, paybacks to friends and whatever. Uh can't recall specifically what data I got back, but data uh, uh, there's lots of data that banks gather, and like your transaction uh, details will be the least of your worry, uh, probably uh, because like banks also do your insurance, so uh, they collect information probably on your age, your health, your occupation, all that sort of stuff that makes it easier for them to tailor uh, their prices, products, etc. to mm -hmm. your kind of stuff. Okay, so our our time is running short, and we have one final question from web user two thirty eight. Uh, are there any common traits about the twenty percent companies that haven't replied? Size, sector, etc. Um, yeah, so uh, as I said, uh, this is one of the areas that the big tech companies do have everything put together. So um, I got basically requests from every one of them except Facebook. We, uh, I don't have an account there anymore, and they claim they didn't have any data, but there's no way for me to figure out. So that's also still uh, a problem. And then, uh, yeah, like the non-requests, like I mentioned, my hairdressers, I just didn't get uh, to the right person in time, and I didn't have mm -hmm. uh, the time and effort to actually uh, dig uh, down to that rabbit hole. But it's usually like the smaller uh, uh, end of the spectrum, as the larger companies do have some fear for the fines they might uh, find mm -hmm. themselves getting. Uh, so at least there's some sort of compliance department uh, over there. Okay, so um, I think that's it. Um, thank you very, very much for your talk. Um, I'm sure people will find you on the interwebs to to communicate you. Uh, do pull requests. You heard him. People <laughs> go and uh, and. Uh, and make this thing a standard. And again, thank you very much. And um, yeah, off to uh, back to uh, the uh, the break. Bye bye. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs>